Um, so yeah, since Yvonne talked about the importance of daylight in the research context, I'm going to be here more in the context of an engineer and lighting designer for daylight. You wouldn't get it from my slides because they are much more boring than what Yvonne has. They were really great. I like them a lot. Um, but we will stay in this notion that daylight is very important, not just for a visual, but also for a non-visual sense. And um, I'm trying to tackle how much daylight we get in buildings and how much we sensibly need to uh, at least reach certain stimuli, uh, stimulus levels for our non-visual pathway. And in the first part of my talk, basically, we will get into the theory of how to evaluate a building in this context before we then get into examples of daylight optimization later on. Let me start off by saying that inside of buildings, we really get very little daylight. And you can get a feeling for that yourself. If you've ever passed by a construction site before the windows are put in, you see those black holes, those black rectangles. And they are black because compared to what you are adapted to on the outside, there is just so little daylight inside and coming back out to your eyes. Once you go inside, obviously, uh, your non-visual system or your visual system will adapt, but your non-visual system can't adapt in the same way. So for the non-visual system, it's still kind of dark. And I want to emphasize that numerically. Um, here we see a graph of light stimuli over one whole day. Um, Yvonne talked about how the non-visual visual pathway has a special receptor, and we are still talking about um, light levels or lux in that content, but it's weighed a little bit different. But it's still, for daylight, you can basically think about it as illuminance. And this is taken from a sensor at the neckline, so it roughly represents uh, what I get as a light level at the eye. And it was taken about two weeks ago. And the special thing really about uh, this day is that besides breakfast, which happened around here, I was either outside, which you can see by those blue lines, or I was inside of a building which was exclusively daylit. So no artificial lighting here. And there are recommendations of what uh, light levels we should reach during the day. And you can see I'm clearly below, below that we are around 100 lux or less. And chances are, even if I had artificial lighting during those situations, I wouldn't have reached this level because that is what we see regularly in our built environment. Now, we, we have very little uh, daylight levels here, but it's not because the daylight was weak. And you can clearly see that once we rescale our graph to the portions of the day when I was outside. Those levels are low because only 0.2% of daylight outside reached my eye level inside. And this percentage of daylight on the inside compared to the outside is what we call a daylight factor. So what Yvonne talked about before, daylight factor, that's a different kind of daylight factor. Here it's more a proportion from the uh, light level inside to outside. And don't believe that this uh, 0.2 is atypically low. This is a systematic problem that we have in our buildings of very little daylight inside. And some people imagine building designs like this as the perfect solution to this. Glazed walls that lead to transparent and daylight flooded interior spaces. But those solutions are bad on so many levels, not least of which is that they don't resemble reality. Because the reality that you get is a black obelisk. And yeah, what you see on the right is the same building than on the left. The left is what was sold during a design competition, but the thermal envelope of a building, it mustn't lead to overheating. So the engineers for building physics, they will just go crazy and they will reduce the radiant transmittance of our glazing as much as possible. And this not only reduces the amount of daylight getting in, but also leads to spectral shifts in color and color rendering and might also affect the 
potency of daylight in terms of uh, stimulating our non-visual path, not to speak of the heightened need for blinds and shades. No, we, we don't need dark towers, but we need smart decisions about what a building geometry should be, window openings, directions, um, finding optimal so solutions for, um, for all those aspects. And in order to design for our non-visual pathway of light, we need a way to evaluate a building's performance in that regard. And this evaluation really hinges on a relatively simple question, which is, what percentage of the year do we reach a certain stimulus level, a threshold? And let's use 250 lux M, uh, melanopic EDI because this is an established value. Uh, you could, of course, use another one, but let's stick with it for now. I also narrowed the time of the day that we are looking at down in the morning from eight when work starts, because we often design for work contexts until 11 o'clock in the morning, because those first hours, they are very important for uh, synchronization. And this question for the outside is relatively simple to answer. If you look at the graph here, you see measurements for Munich for one year, and we have values uh, for zero up to over 100,000 lux. There are some hours during winter when the sun hasn't risen yet, so the answer to our question is not 100% for the outside, but it's quite high still. It's 92%. And this is what I would call a melanopic daylight autonomy. So autonomy through daylight for our non-visual pathway. But this is what you would only get if you suddenly decided to forego civilization like this guy and live on the field from now on. For everyone else who stays indoors, we need to calculate the melanopic daylight autonomy at the eye level inside, and we can use this measure to make design decisions according to our non-visual pathway. Now, to briefly touch on the subject of how much daylight we need for that, this melanopic daylight autonomy can be calculated several ways. You could simulate it, um, and one estimate can be made from the daylight factor that we mentioned before. You remember when I told you that only 0.2% of the outside illuminance reached my eye? Well, basically, this is the daylight factor. There are other things attached to it, but let's stay with it like, like that. And we can use it to define how much daylight roundabout we need in order to reach certain melanopic daylight autonomy levels. And you can see it's not an even spread. There are comparatively low levels here if you want to reach the first few percents of daylight autonomy. And then you, when you get to higher levels, you need more and more percentages. So you need to, to, to approach outside levels for those kind of, of daylight autonomy values. And let me give you an example of how this evaluation works in practice. Here is a project of ours in Munich. I chose it because it's a very standard building. Um, it could be residential. In this case, it's used as an office building. And we evaluated the daylight availability in different floors by building a virtual, virtual model and then calculated the melanopic daylight autonomy. And here we can see the results. Um, they are very common for dense urban areas with this kind of window facade. Uh, what you see here, regardless of the floor, you see very low levels of melanopic daylight autonomy. Um, I mean, there are some values above zero, close to the window, but if you have a second workspace farther away from the window, there is just no time of the year when you reach sufficient levels. Levels somewhat increase as we get higher, first floor, third floor, fourth floor, but they, as I said, they are always low. So the default situation is not very good. Um, so we want to optimize it. And let's get into two examples of data optimization. But before we do, I need to say a sentence or two about the design stage where optimization takes place. Because too often we come into a project where we are tasked with optimizing daylight, uh, but all the major decisions were already made. But because the biggest impact on daylight in buildings come from the geometry of the building itself, where are window openings? What dimensions do they have? What's the floor plan like? 
And too often this is decided upon before looking quantitatively at daylight distribution. And then you can only work on details, but lose out on the biggest optimization. In this example here, we were tasked with optimizing skylights um, in a multi-floor library for a university. And the engineers for building physics, they closed off most of the available glazing area for skylights because they were concerned that it would overheat down here. And in this case, we could convince the architects and clients to at least use the full opening of uh, the skylights um, for, in order to, for daylight to play any role at all. But this required a technical daylight solution. So it's, it's a mirror draster inside the glazing that cuts out the sun. And it's, a, it's really cool, but also very expensive. And it's a, a technical solution to a problem that should really have been solved without extra cost at an earlier stage. And let me show you a simple example of what I mean with that, if you come in early. Here we have a very simple daylight situation in an industrial production site. It's not pretty and it will never be, but it's important because people are working here day and night. And we were tasked with designing an artificial lighting solution, which we won't go into in this presentation, but we were also asked how we would improve on the daylight situation should the roof, should the roof be renewed in a few years. And you can see here, there is some daylight here. Um, here is, here is the, our analysis of the, the stock situation. 5% uh, of the roof are openings, and it's positioned on the crest above a traffic area. Here in this axis, our workers are positioned. So you can see this sad worker here doesn't get any kind of daylight autonomy at all. So um, just moving over the skylight to where the workers are, and spreading it out so that every worker along this axis can get to it uh, already imp improves on the daylight situation greatly. But it's still not optimal. Here you can see an almost optimal setting with 17% uh, roof opening, and it's opened lengthwise above the workplace. And this gives us almost 60% melanopic daylight autonomy for the worker. And then you could really say that those workplaces are now somewhat daylit and reach sufficient levels in summer and most of the time during spring and autumn. But how do I know that 17% is good? Why not 25% or 30% opening? Because it, it certainly would increase the daylight autonomy. And that's the beauty of coming in early because you can really look at the distribution of results for different roof openings and positions of uh, the, those openings and see where increasing the roof opening a little bit increases the daylight autonomy a lot. And that's the percentages that you have to fight for with these thermal engineer guys. And then you get almost like a break point, which is just an artifact of smoothing here, but the principle holds where if you increase the roof opening further, then you really don't get much more daylight autonomy. And this almost parametric design is open in early stages of a building design, and it helps to find satisfying conclusions with very little cost. In the second ex example I want to show you, we come in from a late design stage, and it's from a high school that is built right now in Munich. You can see it from a bird's eye view here. It's a really big building that not only has facade facing windows and classrooms, but also has four inner courtyards here. And you can see the sections of the courtyards here. And those courtyards are really high. They are like 17 meters compared to five and a half meters in width. So there was some concern that the classrooms at the bottom of those uh, courtyards would not receive enough daylight. So we looked at them and I will share the results with one of them with you. Um, here you can see the base result. Um, and as we expected, <laughs> it, it doesn't look great. Those people that you see here, they are the main positions of the teachers in the room. And they are the ones we are concerned with most because uh, students, they leave those rooms after an hour or two, but those teachers are really going to stay here for decades 
Um, in our starting posi position, they never reached a sufficient daylight stimulus, so we were tasked with optimizing the daylight availability. And the problem here is that all the major decisions had been made at those points. We cannot change the position of the atrium, nor can we change its dimensions or the layout of the floor. And in those cases, we can only go through all the surfaces one by one and think about how they could be used to improve daylight distribution. I mean, there are other solutions which we explored, but um, this is mostly true. And in some small details, you might be able to change geometric, um, ge geometry a bit, like in the height of the window lintel here, or in getting a, a slope on the atrium floor or the courtyard floor here. Um, but mostly this is a game of material choices. And one of those I find particularly interesting because we decided to uh, print a pattern on those upper floor windows in order to increase the amount of light that comes down to the lower classrooms at the expense of those upper rooms. But those are not classrooms, they are traffic areas and they are closer to the uh, opening here. So that really changed a lot, even though it's a very expensive measure. Let's look at how those measures changed the daylight availability. You can really see how those small steps do add up to some pretty impressive changes. In, in the end, we have roughly three and a half times more light in the room compared to our starting design. And you could say that daylight now at least plays some role, but we are at a very low level of daylight autonomy still. So I, I would not call those rooms great, but they are not as bad as they started out with. For comparison's sake, we also looked at typical classrooms in the same building that were facade facing, and we didn't look at an optimization, and we were actually kind of shocked, because those are classrooms being designed and built today, achieving every regulatory need, but failing at the basic supply of daylight really in a major way. And we have to do better, and I hope that Yvonne has convinced you that it should be done, and I've shown you that it can be done preferably at an early stage in building design. Obviously, we can't provi provide sufficient daylight in every situation, especially in winter times. And in those cases, it makes sense to substitute daylight with artificial lighting. And while we don't have the time to get into the details in this talk, I want to show you an early solution of ours that has its 10th anniversary next year, and I believe still holds up quite well. It's the dynamic lighting for a carpentry workshop for people with, uh, with special needs, and it consists of two lighting components. And the first component is a more or less standard industrial luminaire that shines light directly downwards. It's very energy efficient and has a neutral white LED spectrum. And to this, we added an indirect component above, and this shines light into the sawtooth roof, which was originally wood in, in the surface, wooden surface. And we fought during the design phase to have those surfaces painted white because wood reflects the important blue part of the spectrum for our non-visual pathway poorly. And the white color thus dramatically increased the amount of daylight coming in and also the reflected light from the indirect component. And what I particularly like about this solution is that it really plays with our expectations of light besides just reaching and partly arbitrary but recommended uh, stimulus level because the spectrum of the indirect component is very blue focused. And we had to use a fluorescent light back then for cost reasons, uh, but it could still be done today. It, this one has over 10,000 Kelvin and this is a very cool white color temperature, similar to what you get in the sky without the sun. And it's very similar to the daylight coming in through those northern skylights here. And compared to that, the 4000 Kelvin LED light, which is neutral white, it looks very warm in comparison to the eye. And this is the same effect that the sun has in the sky. And all of this makes the design very pleasant on a subconscious level and adds to the positive effect of the added non-visual stimulus. Okay, 
So we've gone through a lot of things. Um, let's quickly summarize and wrap this up. Um, we started off by saying that the amount of daylight inside a building is but a fraction of the outside potential. And that depending on location and the relative amount of daylight that we get at a person's eye, daylight can be sufficient for over 90% of the year outdoors and realistically about 70% indoors. Indoor environments even today are not designed according to our non-visual needs and thus commonly only have sufficient stimuli in summer, sometimes not even that as I showed you. Maximizing the glazed surface, however, is clearly the wrong direction. We need smart geometric and material choices and they are cheaper and better. We can optimize daylight in an early design stage in a huge manner and it's easy, cheap and very rewarding. In a later design stage, it's still possible and worth trying, but likely the measures are limited and might be costly. Daylight supplements are possible, but should always be added to a sound based design of daylight. We didn't have get time into multiple artificial lighting situations, but let me just say, obviously, they um, vary widely in technical complexity and there is no one size fits all. And lastly, um, it's just reiterating what Yvonne said, light has or daylight has more than physiological effects, the psychological or sometimes called emotional effects and visual effects always need to be considered as well. So for example, you could take this angle in the courtyard floor literally, or you can interpret it in a uh, designed way like we did here with those mirrored um, spheres where you're not only redirecting light but also giving the students and teachers a view of the sky that they wouldn't have elsewhere okay so thanks a lot for staying with me even though i'm like two minutes over remember to go outside once in a while buildings can't do everything there are almost no wrong directions um, choose the right ones thank you very much